Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to worship with Westminster. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, that season in which we prepare for the coming of Christ, prepare for Christmas, uh, each week uh, leaning into the, the reality of what he has done and what he has promised he will still do. And we'll talk more about that later on in the service. Today is also St. Andrew's Day, the day in which our church celebrates our theological heritage, our Presbyterian roots that stretch back into the Scottish Reformation, uh, hence the pipes and the kilts. Although I, I will say that I'm missing the, the shortbread today since we're not meeting in person, uh, but I'm, I'm sure we can catch up with that next year, right? Okay. Um, you know, it's a good thing to, to remember who we are and where we have come from. It can give such great perspective and inspiration and courage in the midst of our own times of trial. For example, remembering that our Presbyterian heritage was formed out of a deep desire to make sure that this, the story of God, the scripture, would be available to all people no matter who they were, no matter where they were, and that they would all be able to read it for themselves. These are the, the theological foundations under, uh, underneath who we are even still today. Uh, you know, that my kilt pin actually is, is uh, imprinted with a... Uh, um, a figure of a burning bush, and then the, the Latin phrase, nec tamen consumabator, which means, and yet it was not consumed. Uh, it's uh, taken from Exodus chapter 3 in Moses there on the mountain seeing the burning bush. And it was a, 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 both a, an image and a slogan that was used during the time of the Scottish Reformation, reminding the church that even in the midst of the fires of their persecution, uh, God would be faithful and that they would, they would make it through. And I think that's such a great reminder for us today. Uh, we are not being persecuted as a church. There is nothing that is stopping us from going forward with the gospel. We are not being hunted down because we have scripture. We're not being burned at the stake because we've been caught with the scripture. We don't have to take our church Bible home each night and hide it somewhere because it's the only precious copy that we as a group of people have. We're not being persecuted but we are living through times of trouble and certainly times of inconvenience. And yet in the midst of all of those, we can still stand with our theological forebearers and say, we will not be consumed. God is good, God is great, God is gracious, and he will see us through. You know, one of the ways that we lean into our identity uh, and our roots together is to proclaim what we have always believed and what we still hold true today. So I'd love as we begin our time of worship together to uh, join together in reciting the Apostles' Creed. You'll find the words on your screen. Let us proclaim what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us worship God, starting with the lighting of our Advent candles. Hi, I'm Lynn Leisler, and this is my granddaughter, Renee. If ever there was a year when we needed Advent, if ever there was a year when we needed hope, this is such a year. It's difficult to get a grip on the mess that 2020 has been for us. We've seen so much challenge, so much hurt, so much loss. Sometimes it has felt like nothing is right. Nothing is like it used to be. Nothing is safe. We need God to be close to us now. And yet we are not the first to feel that way. In Isaiah 64, the prophet cries out, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. Isaiah knew that God is greater than any of our troubles, and he put his hope in God's saving presence. We light this first Advent candle as a sign of hope. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, right into the mess of our world in order to save us. 
God sees us and loves us. Loves us. Even this year, God is with us, and we hope, and so we have hope. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that even as we wait for the transformation of our broken world, we do so as people who have already seen your redeeming love. We know that we will be okay because we belong to you. And so we join the prophet Isaiah in declaring, you did awesome things that we did not look for. You came down from an old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. And so we put our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. My name is Lynn Leisler, and I'm here to lead us in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we have just celebrated Thanksgiving. Please help us to keep thankful hearts to remember what the Apostle Paul encouraged, to be thankful in all things. Now, as we enter Advent, help us to continue that thankfulness in this season of Advent, the time to prepare our hearts for the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. We stand in awe knowing that you loved us that much. No matter our crazy world, Advent and Christmas are about you. Help us to focus on the incarnation of God becoming human to walk among us. You came into a world as off balance as ours, or perhaps more so. Help us be less harried this year and to consider ways to reach out to each other to truly find the perfect gift, the meaningful celebration. Help us to show Christ's love to those in our homes, in our communities, to everyone we come in contact with. And Lord, be with those who are isolated, that they may feel a comfort and peace beyond human understanding. Be with our country. Help us to heal and love each other the way that you love. Be with ministries that offer hope and help to those who are hurting and in need, those we support here at Westminster and others locally and around the globe. Be with those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are still reeling from loss due to fire or health issues or loss of family and friends or peace of mind or loss of finances. Help us to be generous and share what we have, little or much, with those who are in need. Remind us throughout each day that no matter what, in you we have hope. Please walk with us in this Advent season. May we cling to you, Lord, and share that hope and your love with those around us. Now let's join together and pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just wanted to say thank you once more for your faithful, ongoing, generous support for Westminster and our ministries and for our mission partners here in the Valley and around the world. In this time of Thanksgiving, it is so very easy for me to look around at this amazing family of faith and be filled with gratitude. You are good, you are generous, you are faithful. Uh, and I, it is one of my great hopes that someday together we will be able to look at the ongoing ripples of, of grace that have started with simple gifts through this family of faith and that have uh, been used by God around this world to bring transformation and healing and hope. Thank you again. Ways to Give will be found shortly on your screen. Okay, so at first, this year's Advent series might seem a little odd. As you know, since Easter, we've been working our way through the story of God, the, an overview of the whole Bible from start to finish. Only the closer we uh, have come to the end, the, the more I came to realize that the book of Revelation was going to fall within the first week of Advent. And that meant for me either uh, having to cut the series short or to remove some of those great parts in the middle, neither of which I really wanted to do. So I came up with this crazy idea. What about actually doing the book of Revelation as the Advent series? And yeah, at first, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? Now, now those two things, they just don't seem to go together. 
I, I mean, generally we see Advent and the Christmas story as being nice and sweet and cozy. I mean, hopeful, cheerful times of the year, a, a faithful peasant couple, a baby in the manger, shepherds and their little cute sheep that we have as part of our, our Christmas pageant every year, and the, and the magi and the twinkling stars in the sky and the angel voices. While the book of Revelation, on the other hand, is full of dragons and monsters and beasts and disasters and plagues and the sky literally falling. And this is world-ending stuff. What could those two things possibly have to do with one another? Well, the more time I spent looking at those two events side by side, the more I have been reminded that they actually have absolutely everything to do with one another. See, while the Advent is a celebration of the coming of Christ, the promise that is fulfilled at Christmas, Revelation is actually called the second Advent because it's also about the promised coming of Christ, the, the final promise that is yet to be fulfilled. And both of those stories share a host of elements and images and themes and meanings, even as both of them also point to world-changing, universe-transforming, cosmic implications as Christ redefines reality for us. And so for the next few weeks, between now and Christmas, we are going to be looking at Advent and Second Advent next to each other, a sort of cosmic Christmas, if you will. It won't be by any means a full study of the book of Revelation. That would be impossible to do in four sermons. But we will examine the main themes of the book of Revelation, which also happen to be the main themes of the Christmas story, believe it or not. I mean, among other things, if you look at both of these stories, you see that they are both about, first of all, the promised yet surprising coming of the king. And not just a king, but the king of all the universe who comes to be with us. The king that, that even the stars and the angels declare and, and worship. And yet that this king in his coming, his ways are contrasted with and resisted by the forces of sin and darkness and evil often through the kingdoms and powers and structures of this world. We don't have space for him in our story. His coming is resisted, even in our own hearts. And yet, in his coming, he brings redemption and salvation and complete and total victory on a cosmic scale. And it's accomplished and fulfilled by his very presence. The king's coming is what truly matters. And finally, that this gift, God's gift of himself, is actually offered to all people, no matter who you are or what your background is, where you came from, to all nations, this gift is held out. Those are actually the main themes of the incarnation, of the Christmas story. And they are, are the main themes that are re brought right back around again in the book of Revelation. So each week between now and Christmas, we're going to look at one of those themes, as well as pointing out some other of the parallel, parallels that we can see within the texts. So a slightly different take on Christmas this year. Not your usual silent night or oh little town of Bethlehem, peaceful slumber kind of Christmas story, but a cosmic message that the one who has come is changing everything. Uh, hopefully this will be a study that will help us to both bring to a, a rousing close the story of God, and yet at the same time will allow us to step deeper and, and gain more insight into this season that we celebrate, that is joyful and is about peace on earth, because the, this amazing king of the universe has stepped down to where we are. So let's start by looking at the promise. But first, let's start with prayer. Would you join me? Gracious God, show us again what it is that you are doing amongst us, what you have already done in your son, Jesus Christ, what you will again do, and what, Lord, you are doing right now in each of our own hearts, bringing transformation and restoration and new life. Come and do that again, Lord, we ask in the name of Christ. 
Amen. So for more than 600 years, the prophets had been foretelling the coming of the Messiah. And actually, if you remember back to the beginning of the story of God, that promise has, has kind of been woven throughout the entirety of the story, even all the way back to the book of Genesis and the story of the fall. Already the seeds of the promise of the Messiah coming were, were being developed. But it isn't really until the time of the prophets, which is around 600 years before Christ is born, that that promise is, started, uh, is fleshed out. <clears throat> Who he would be, where he would be born, what tribe and lineage he would be from, what would be his purpose, what he would accomplish. All of those details are coming through the prophets. In fact, there are so many details in the prophets about the coming of Jesus that you can practically tell the whole Christmas story only using Old Testament passages. And yet, despite all of those details being there, when Jesus finally came, it was a total surprise. For some, it was a great surprise, right? Mary was surprised and terrified, but also really excited, as was Joseph and Mary's extended family and the shepherds and the magi. All were surprised and terrified and awed and excited. And then there were others, like Herod and Herod's advisors, who were surprised and a little terrified, but not for very excited. They were more angry and violent, and we'll talk more about that next week. But I, get the, I guess the point is that even though the promise was foretold and highlighted and described in great detail, still the coming of Christ was unexpected and sudden, and it took people completely by surprise as their whole reality shifted underneath their feet. Anyone who saw it could not remain unmoved. And at the same time, that promise, that reality, that same theme surrounds the book of Revelation. And in fact, all of this discussions throughout the New Testament about the second coming of Christ. Jesus himself says that it will be like a thief in the night when he comes. And it will take people, once again, completely by surprise. And even though he and the book of Revelation give signs and hints and promises and descriptions and details, somehow we all will still be caught by surprise when once again reality completely shifts underneath our feet. Just like when he came the first time, people going about their normal everyday business unaware that God was moving, he will move again. And yet this time, everyone will see it. As Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. There will be surprise and there will be awe and there will be either excitement or terror depending on how prepared our hearts are for his coming. And that's because whether we are talking about the incarnation, the first coming, the Christmas story, or Revelation, the second coming, it's the same one who's coming. It is the same king. Yes, the first time he came as an infant, and yet it was still the same cosmic king who took flesh. And it will be the same king who comes again. It's the same figure that's described in both of the passages we're going to look at today. Two differing accounts, starting with Luke chapter 1. This is the familiar Christmas passage. Listen for the word of God. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, 
the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, we hear this Christmas passage every year, and there are such great descriptions within it. His name, Jesus, Yahshua, the Lord saves. He will be great. Well, what does that mean? Great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. He, he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Or he will be called Holy, the Son of God. We, we hear these words repeated every Christmas as part of the story. We hear them sung in our songs. We hear them every year, but do we really know what it is that they mean? Right? The image of the innocent, helpless baby in a manger is so strong and compelling that it sometimes sweeps us away and we forget who it is that Gabriel is actually describing here. I mean, who is really coming? Look at those descriptions again. You know, it might actually be easier to see those same descriptions in a different context if we're going to understand them. And so we're going to look at Revelation chapter 5, and you'll notice that you're actually hearing or seeing some of the same things that Gabriel was just describing. Again, listen for the word of God from Revelation 5, verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders... I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This also is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I know that Revelation is a book full of imagery, and yet I think despite or maybe even because of the imagery, you can see the nature of the one who is being described here. Does it sound like a Christmas passage? Right there at the center of the universe, surrounded by people and nations and countless beings of incredible power, all bowing down in reverence and awe is the king, the lamb. He is the one to whom everything else points. He is the only one who is worthy. He's the only one who is holy and righteous and good, worthy to receive all honor and glory and blessing. And actually, we see echoes of that, small glimpses of it in the Christmas story. Or we see the same kind of descriptions, just kind of shaped for an infant instead. It's like the throne is there, smaller, in the manger. We see it in Mary and Joseph's willingness to lay aside not just their plans, but the trajectory of their entire lives in obedience to God's movement. We see it in the, in the veneration of the shepherds, in the adoration of the magi, in the, the angel host's proclamations of glory ringing through the skies. It's an echo of that same throne room. You know, some people see, some people recognize that the one who has come 
is indeed worthy. He's the same one who sits on the throne who always has. He is eternally the king. And I think that some of that then carries over into our Christmas celebrations, right? We, we certainly feel the worth of this gift. We know that this season and what it stands for is precious. But the part that I think that we in our modern celebrations usually feel disconnected from, the feeling that was most definitely present in that first story that w- with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the magi, and yes, even in the angels, the thing that we're disconnected from is the trembling. You know, we may see the value of the gift, but we often miss the magnitude. You know, we know that the news that Christ has come is joyous and good, but we often forget the searing holiness, the blinding glory, the unattainable goodness that defines the one who has come to take flesh among us, to be with us, and who will someday soon come again in glory. You know, the book of Revelation should actually inform our Christmas celebrations and temper our feelings of joy with the equal sense of reverence and awe. Yes, we should absolutely tremble with excitement and cheer and thanksgiving, but we should also tremble with fear and amazement because the the baby who lies in a manger has come not just to redeem sinners, He has, absolutely, but not just to redeem sinners. He has also come to abolish and to condemn sin and evil and hate and darkness once and for all. This child comes to shatter the darkness. The light has come. The darkness that we sometimes love so dearly and grip too tightly, he's come to shatter it. You know, the very innocence of this lamb the one who will forevermore now bear the scars of having been slain for sin. That very innocence condemns the darkness within us that will lead him to the cross. And oh, how it is that he condemns. Look at the condemnation of Christmas. Yeah, it's love. He loves, he serves, he sacrifices this incredible Amazing, undeserved love and grace washes over an undeserving people and fills us with acceptance and hope. And in so doing, it absolutely shines a spotlight on my own pettiness and selfishness and small-minded, self-centered, sinful desires. You know, my filth is all too apparent in the presence of his purity. This is true for all of us. He doesn't have to come swinging a sword of judgment. Instead, he simply has to show his character. He has to show who he is. And we are left falling to our knees at the manger's side, gazing upon the king of glory in his vulnerability and saying, woe is me. Woe is me that I have let such darkness define me when here is my king laying it all down. So our our joyous, sparkling Advent season, our joyous, sparkling Christmas time, our our hope-filled Advent becomes also a time of deep repentance. When we truly see who has come, we cannot also help but see who he has come to, who he has come for. You know, German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer did a great deal of thinking and writing on the topic of the incarnation and therefore on Christmas. You know, in one of his sermons on this topic, he challenges our modern, well, for him, 1940s, view of Christmas. He writes this. When early Christianity spoke of the return of the Lord Jesus, they thought of a great day of judgment Even though this thought may appear to us to be so unlike Christmas, it is original Christianity and to be taken extremely seriously. We have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God's coming should arouse in us. 
We are indifferent to the message, taking only the the pleasant and agreeable out of it and forgetting the serious aspect that the God of the world draws near to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us. The coming of God is truly not only a joyous message, but is first frightful news for anyone who has a conscience. And only when we have felt the frightfulness of the matter can we know the incomparable favor. God comes in the midst of evil, in the midst of death, and judges the evil in us and in the world. And in judging it, he loves us. He purifies us. He sanctifies us. He comes to us with his grace and love. And when it comes right down to it, the coming of God among us cannot be seen as a small thing, even if it's wrapped up in an infant. When we hear the name Emmanuel, God with us, we should feel a tremble of joy. We should be filled with great comfort, for we know that our God is for us. But we should also remember that that does not mean that God is for everything that we are for. For our hearts still stand in need of redemption. There's deep surgery in us that still has yet to be completed. And that is something that we should take seriously, even as part of the Christmas story. Advent is both a time of hope and a time of repentance. Hope because we know that we will be redeemed. And repentance because we know we need to be redeemed. You know, in the midst of this year's trials and troubles and pressing darkness, Advent is a reminder that we are a people of the promise. That Jesus has come and will come again. He is powerful enough to transform and redeem all that is broken, no matter how grim it might look. And that is good news. And he is also holy enough that we need to know that we too are part of what must be transformed and redeemed. And so be willing to soften our hearts to his holy coming. You know, Jesus several times talks about his second coming. And each time he gives a command, a command that is echoed in the book of Revelation. And interestingly enough, happens to be the same command that the prophets had given before his coming the first time. Prepare the way. Be ready. Open your hearts and make straight the path for the Lord. Repent and let God start the transformation even now within you. Not just the world needs to be saved. We do too. For the one who comes is truly our king and he is coming to lay complete and total claim upon us. He came once before and laid that claim and proved it in the cross and in the empty tomb. And he's coming again. And yes, it will be a surprise, but may it be a glorious, wonderful surprise that we are a people who are ready for him, waiting, giving him our best even now. There is hope in the promise, and there's also challenge. Let us live into that challenge this Advent season as we prepare our hearts for him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, come and be born in us once more and shower us, Lord, with your amazing grace that it might break open our hardened hearts and prepare a way for your grace and love to grow and flourish within us and spread into a world that desperately needs it. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship God singing of his amazing grace.
Friends, our God has come in Jesus Christ. This is the story and promise of Advent and of Christmas. And he will come again to complete the transformation that has already been begun. In the meantime, hold fast to this truth that it is God himself who comes to us and that he is worthy of our best. Let that lead you to a life of ongoing repentance and hope and transformation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and always. Amen. Thank you.